Dr. Oberfield is the uh, president for the Pediatric Endocrine Society. We greatly appreciate the support that you provided to Pestola and other regional pediatric endocrine societies. Um, she's the director uh, of the pediatric program at Columbia, um, is well published in the area of adrenal disorders and polycystic ovary syndrome. And so she will be kicking off our program here with an update on polycystic ovary syndrome in adolescents. So thank you again, Dr. Oberfield, for joining us. Thank you so much. It is truly an honor to be here. Um, and uh, having a daughter who is a child and family psychiatrist at Columbia, but started her medical school training at Tulane, I do feel uh, somewhat akin to uh, the Pistola audience and Dr. Steelman as well. And I thank Dr. Nunez also for giving me the call whether or not I would be able to say yes. She said I had to say yes. So here I am. And again, I thank all those who helped with the computer glitch. Some of you have made me have maybe heard me lecture before. And I usually say, if I speak faster than I am doing, I probably will be evaluated for hyperthyroidism. And given the fact we're running a little late, I will try to go through most of the slides. But if the uh, moderator decides to put a kibosh and tell me to stop, we'll do so. Um, basically, I the only thing that's not happening is the slides are not advancing. So uh, there we go. I have no conflict of interest, unfortunately. And uh, we will start. We will go through a brief introduction, a historical definition, what is hyperandrogenism, hirsutism, menstrual cycles, polycystic ovarian morphology, and current treatment in um, the adolescent population. Once we finish that, we'll go on to what's new. I hope I have time to talk about a little bit of the 11 oxoandrogens, which is currently a passion of mine. This is advancing on its own, and this is not going to be good. So does anyone know how to stop this from doing that? Uh, I'm screen sharing. I don't have anything. So let's go back. Okay, we'll go on the genetics, a little bit of AMH, adipocyte biology, the microbiome, and some conclusion. Now, PCOS is a very common disorder. Some people feel that it's between five and 16% uh, in the adult population of women. Uh, we also know that there may be variant uh, of the disorder in male with different expressions, of course. And the disorder starts, can you see my arrow? If not, uh, just yell out. Um, we have the upper systems here with the hypothalamic and pituitary axis. Probably there's an input of progesterone, which is currently being more fully evaluated, that results in abnormal GnRH pulsation, resulting in abnormal pituitary release of LHFSH. The ovary is the target. There's ovulatory dysfunction causing follicular arrest, and this is often manifested in polycystic ovarian morphology. There's, uh, there's also hyperandrogenism, which um, actually it's very interesting. We now know that a lot of it is dependent on SHBG levels, and the adrenal androgens, including the 11 oxos, are now more in the press and highlighted. And although insulin resistance is not one of the criterion for PCOS, we know that many women, in fact, are insulin resistant. There's more evidence that there's adipose dysfunction. And as everyone says now, more to come. We will discuss hyperinsulinemia probably in about five years. The historical definitions of uh, the differential diagnosis here uh, has to be uh, dealt with before, before we go further, because you can't say someone has PCOS unless you make sure there isn't a disorder of hyperthicosis, very rarely an ovarian tumor. Most commonly, it is confused with non-classic adrenal hyperplasia 
Cushing syndrome, glucocorticoid resistance, and an adrenal tumor can also present in this manner. Of course, we have to rule out hypoprolactinemia use or hypothyroidism, use of medication, idiopathic hirsutism, idiopathic hyperandrogenism, and rarely a luteoma of pregnancy or an aromatase deficiency in a fetus can present in this manner. So what is PCOS and what are the classic definitions that we use? The NIH in 1990 had a consensus meeting and it was more like a paper than a bing, 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 you have to have all of these. But everybody started to think about PCOS as having two issues, clinical and or biochemical hyperandrogenism, chronic oligo and or anovulation. This is the strictest definition. Frankly, in all the studies that I have done, I use this definition, but it is very rigid definition. And then in 2004, the Rotterdam criteria added ultrasound appearance of the PCOS but we often say that in adolescence, and I'll go into that in detail, that is not a criterion that should at all be used, uh, except in rare instances. In 2009, the Androgen Excess Society, uh, with um, lots of work from Ricardo Aziz, came up with the following, that you have to have hyperandrogenism, that's hirsutism and or blood levels of hyperandrogenemia and ovarian dysfunction that manifests itself as oligo or anovulation and or now use of the sonogram to demonstrate and or polycystic ovaries. However, all require exclusion of known disorders of androgen excess and anovulation. And as I said, in the adolescence, we must screen for non-classic adrenal hyperplasia. The 2018 guidelines also endorse using four phenotypic descriptions. They're not really used in adolescence, A, B, C, D, and just to highlight B is the most rigid and the original NIH criteria. Um, and not all of them apply in adolescence. So let's talk quickly about hyperandrogenism. And as you see here, there's free testo, there's testo by dialysis. All I want to share with you is that the more specific assays you use, the better you are at diagnosing elevated androgens. Clinically, we can look at hyperandrogenism. It may Again, we are having a slideshow problem here. Hirsutism, it may be a useful marker, but it has to be profound hirsutism. Acne is very common in adolescence. So um, it's really nonspecific, and I'll describe which kind of acne we can use. And androgenic alopecia, there's little data supporting its use as a marker. So again, more diving deeply, how can we improve the diagnosis of hyperandrogenism? Technically, as I alluded, you use specific assays, liquid chromatography or mass spec. And I always have my patients come in early morning if possible, early follicular if they have cycling at all so that we catch the highest level in and don't get a lower level in the afternoon of their androgens. What cutoffs do you use? Well, there are multiple assays for normal levels for free testosterone. So we really say above the upper range of normal for that specific assay. Universally, we kind of feel that testosterone levels of 60 nanogram per deciliter are probably reasonable. If you find nothing, but you still have a high index of suspicion, I would consider androstenedione and DHES to be a measured as well. We're trying to go back here. And uh, Delta-4 androstene down probably in the 250 range and elevated DS also in about the 250 range is what we see. Uh, let's see if it will now go forward. Okay, how do we find clinical hyperandrogenism? It's unwanted hair growth in a male-like pattern, acne 
unresponsible to topical treatment. So most acne, you use a few washes, a little bit of therapy, but acne that's not responsive to treatment, that's different. And most adolescent acne does respond to treatment. Male pattern hair loss and or irregular menses, all of these can be used to define clinical hyperandrogenism. Now let's talk about the normal menstrual cycle. These are definitions. And again, as pediatricians first and then endocrinologists, uh, we use the same tools we learned in med school. Average age, mini, median age of menarche is usually about 12.4. The mean cycle interval is about 32 days in the first gynecologic year. Menstrual cycle interval is usually between 21 to 45 days. Menstrual flow length is usually about seven days. And everyone says I have very heavy bleeding, but the product use routinely is between three to six pads or tampons per day. Much excess of that would be considered heavier bleeding. And remember, because long cycles most often occur in the first three years post menarche, the overall trend is toward shorter and more regular cycles with increasing age. By the third year after menarche, about 60 to 80 percent of menstrual cycles fit this 21 to 34 days, which is typical of adults. And now we're stuck. Hmm. All right, so I'll go on to this slide. Um, the age of onset of menstruation uh, and establishment of 50% ovulation is very important uh, to remember that the younger you are when you get your first period, the faster you get to 50% ovulation and have ovulatory cycles. The older you are, if your menses is over 13, this is the important thing. You can't say abnormal cycling until you're at least five years post menarche. Now, irregular menses that we define are greater than one year and less than three years post menarche, less than 21 or 45 days. If you're more than three years post menarche, less than 21 or 35 days, and we always remark that if you're more than one year post menarche and your cycle is more than three months, that should be evaluated. And there's been a slight downward trend. Primary amenorrhea is considered 15 or greater than three years post onset of breast tissue. For adolescents, and this is a take home, who have features of PCOS, but do not meet the diagnostic criteria, we should call an increased risk. And an increased risk, I'm having gremlins in here going back and forth. Um, an increased risk can be held till at least eight post menarchal years, according to all the criteria. Most recently, the Copenhagen mother child cohort in over 1,200 girls. Uh, wound up looking at 317 girls with the median age of 16, 2.9 years after menarche. They came up with the median age in that European population of 13.3, a little bit older. They were not overweight. The BMI was 21. But interestingly, if you relook the data, about 8.5% of the girls had by the PCOS criteria of Rotterdam definition that they could be considered having PCOS. Now, I am wondering why my slides don't advance. Okay, now they do. So what are the recommendations regarding PCOM morphology? And I quote from a paper where we looked at the PCOS issues in adolescents. There's no compelling criteria to define PCOS morphology for adolescents since we have really not established this. Until further research defines more strict criteria, 
I would say that unless there's a very enlarged ovary greater than 12 cubic centimeters by formulate volume, it can be considered enlarged, but follicle counts should not be utilized because a multifollicular pattern, which is defined by the presence of large follicles distributed throughout the ovary, does not have a relationship with hyperandrogenism, interestingly. And it is going back to the 80s and 90s, having been described as very common in adolescents. In fact, many adolescents may even have larger ovaries, higher follicular counts, and um, indeed is not pathology. As I said just now, healthy girls with regular menstrual cycles and without hyperandrogenism can have a polycystic ovarian morphology. And this is a very good paper by Ethel Codner a number of years ago where she looked at over a four year period, two years after cycling, three years after cycling and four years. And some of the patients had positive ovarian morphology that then disappeared. Some had none throughout, some had none that became. So there's clearly over the maturation process, a developmental change. And therefore, again, we do not look at volume of the ovary unless it's very large and certainly follicular count at this point is not regarded as a criteria. So what are the goals of treatment? The goals of treatment are short-term goals, include regular menses, decrease in the signs and symptoms of androgen excess, improve self-esteem, and if present, we treat the impaired glucose tolerance and or diabetes, which rarely is found. The long-term goals involve, again, regularizing the menses, decrease signs and symptoms, again, of androgen excess, improve self-esteem, improve fertility, decrease risk for impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes, decrease the risk for other aspects of metabolic syndrome, decrease the risk for sleep apnea, and decrease the risk for endometrial disease. And the treatment considerations, there are few, this is, okay, there are few trials in adolescents that really, really have large numbers or actually um, use specific guidelines and criteria for definition of polycystic ovary disease. For weight loss, um, as well as use in overweight adolescents uh, who may have irregular cycling, we first try lifestyle treatment. For treatment of acne, hirsutism, or anovulatory cycles, or to prevent pregnancy in, com in combination, hormonal contraceptive pills have been used or uh, other routes of use of the estrogens. For treatment of IGT, metabolic syndrome, metformin. The optimal duration of treatment, however, has not been determined. Going back. The Treatment considerations are again, and this was a study that looked at overall what's used, hormonal contraception or metformin. Hirsutism is treated either way. Acne, more likely you'll lose hormonal contraception. Anovulatory cycles or infrequent menses, you are more likely to use hormonal contraception. And with obesity, we usually start with a very obese person if the lifestyle did not work, lifestyle changes, which have a very uh, poor uh, positive outcome, we often start metformin. Now, uh, just as a basic review for some of the common agents that we use, estrogen, progesterone, if you use the pill, 
Uh, we usually use the lowest dosage possible of estrogen, the, even though higher dosing has been used in the past, the mechanism of action, it inhibits ovarian androgen secretion, of course, will increase hepatic SHBG production, decrease circulating free androgens. We know there are many side effects, breast tenderness, headaches, potential increased risk of venous thrombosis, increased insulin resistance, and altered lipid profiles. And we have here some contraindications, obviously pregnancy, uncontrolled hypertension. A very recent study that just came out actually said that up to 15% of women overall with uh, PCOS do have hypertension, there's liver dysfunction, and so on. I always ask a history of mother having any uh, thrombophilia or any blood clots, uh, or any complications. And before so treating these girls, we do get an extensive family history. Again, I am for whatever reason with the glitches we have had, my computer is not responding. So we have to just wait. Okay, metformin, uh, we go up to one gram BID. The mechanisms of action, there's upregulation of the energy centers, STK11 and AMPK. There's an improvement in insulin sensitivity in muscle and adipose tissue. There's a downregulation of hepatic gluconeogenesis. It improves the fasting blood glucose. There's an increase in GLP. Uh, one secretion and GLP-1 receptor expression translated, it just improves the postprandial blood glucose and a decrease in ovarian and adrenal androgen production. Uh, side effects, GI, lactic acidosis, mainly in older patients who have renal failure, edema, myalgia, temporarily elevated LFTs. And we found if we start the metformin at night in very low dose and build up, you usually don't have GI discomfort. And here you see the list of contraindications. And the mechanism of action of metformin actually has been looked at. It's an insulin sensitizer that accumulates in the matrix of the mitochondria, and it inhibits the respiratory chain at complex one, resulting in decreased oxygen consumption rate and a reduction of proton-driven synthesis of ATP. The resultant mild decrease in energy status leads to an acute and transient inhibition of the energy consuming gluconeogenic pathway. And in addition, MK, MP, MK is activated by ATP depletion and may lead to reduction in hepatic lipogenesis and improved hepatic insulin sensitivity. Spiranolactone, a lot of people use. I frankly am putting it in here. I have not used it consistently, but many feel that it is a very useful agent to decrease hirsutism. Uh, I have seen uh, hypotension, even electrolyte disturbance, irregular menses can develop. And um, many people use it in concert uh, with um, an oral contraceptive because uh, it is somewhat teratogenic and you know the mechanism of action is resulting in an androgen receptor blockade competitive with DHT, the most potent androgen that we have. You'll have to wait, this is glitched. I'm sorry, folks. Just wondering if there's something going on that I'm not aware. It does not forward and does not backward. I certainly don't want to escape. Okay, flutamide uh, is used more in Europe 
Um, it's uh, androgen receptor blockade. It's dose dependent side effects. Uh, it's contraindicated in pregnancy and is associated with liver dysfunction. Uh, pioglitazone, most useful in Europe, we have not been using it a lot. It's a peroxisome proliferator activated receptor, gamma activator, that's a mouthful, at low dose inhibition of CDK5 mediated phosphorylation of the peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma. Uh, it can cause weight gain. There's lots of data that in adults in very high doses, there can be a risk of bladder cancer. And of course, it's contraindicated in pregnancy or with liver dysfunction. Uh, actually, there is a study that was done by Lourdes Sibanez, my colleague who I've written a number of the consensus and uh, guidelines for PCOS in adolescents with. She used uh, a protocol for proof of concept of low-dose spiranolactone, pioglitazone, metformin as compared to an oral contraceptive, 12 months treatment versus then following 12 months no treatment in a small group of Catalan women. Um, the primary outcomes were ovulation rate and the secondary outcome was body composition, abdominal fat, increased insulin levels or increased androgens. And I just wanna take you over to this end, Rand, uh, Red is the oral contraceptive and blue is Spiomed. And what you see here, there is free testo goes down actually quicker with the oral contraceptive, but after coming up, goes up higher. And the free androstenedione also similarly. And there's a relatively good result uh, from use of these agents. We haven't been doing this in the States at the moment. So, if all uh, is pointing that the person does not want or in adjuvant therapy to medication, we do have local therapeutics, cosmetics, including be bleaching, chemical appellation, plucking, waxing, shaving, electrolysis, and laser hair removal. I do caution, and I'm sure all of you have experience, that with various complexions, there is potential of different results and can include in those with darker complexion, uh, more scarring and changes in the coloration of the skin after these procedures. So with that in mind, I, when is the next talk? Because I have about another 15 minutes to go through all the new stuff. I'll go forward since we started late. Is that all right? I'm not hearing no, so we'll go forward. We'll talk about the 11 oxoandrogens, some genetics, AMH, and so forth. Tell me how to go, Dr. Steele. Should I go quickly? Um, if you could a little bit. I mean, we, you know, we, we kind of know that we're going to have to deal with with talks running late anyway with live meetings. Um, so we don't wanna give you shorten your talk. I'm gonna abbreviate our questions at the end so that we can try to stay on track, but please try to um, get the things that you feel like are most important. Okay, good. So we have here uh, the androgen biosynthesis pathway. We have the back door pathway, which has recently been described going to DHT. We have the standard pathway going to testosterone and newer are the 11 oxo androgens. And let me go here. The androgenic activity of these 11 oxo androgen steroids have been described by some as being nil, by others as being very significant. Up till now, we only thought that they were important in the Telias fish. And now we see that probably they are important more than we know in other mammalian species, including us. Uh, there are extremely important uh, to, uh, papers recently that talk about the androgenic activity of 11 oxygenated steroids. And there have been beautiful comparative studies demonstrated that 11 keto testosterone and 11 keto DHT bind to the human adrenal androgen receptor. Human 
androgen receptor similar affinity as of T and DHT. And 11-ketotestosterone and 11-ketodihydrotestosterone, importantly, were able to induce androgen receptor-regulated gene expression and cell growth in two androgen-dependent prostate cancer cell lines. And now for PCOS, there hasn't been um, too many studies in adolescents, but in adults, the original one was by O'Reilly's team. Uh, studied a few years ago that the 11 oxoandrogens in rose and pink are higher in the PCOS population than in their controls. Now, the genetics of the polycystic ovary syndrome are multifold. We won't have time to go into them, but there are genes involved in the ovarian and adrenal steroidogenesis pathways. There are genes involved in steroid effects, genes that are involved in gonadotropin action and regulation, and one and others. And for time, let's just go here. There was a huge study of over 10,000 cases of um, women of European ancestry and over 100,000 control. Again, they clumped together all different reports using different criteria. To date, 19 loci are associated with PCOS. At least six loci are shared between the Chinese and European GWAS. And with the exception, however, of one loci, the data supports common genetic architecture underlying the different phenotypes. Now, what data are available on DENDA 1A? DENDA 1A is the only one that has been identified a between both Chinese and European population as a PCOS susceptibility gene. They're members of this gene as members of connectants, which have three DEN domains. These domains function as G guanine nucleotide exchange factors to help with endocytosis and integration of proteins and lipids. And what I just want to show you is when you look at the expression in a normal cell, and in a PCOS theca cell, there is much more protein localized here in the theca of those with PCOS. So this may be an important, important gene in PCOS. Most recently, there was a clustering analysis of 893 women with PCOS and cutting to the chase, they found two uh, different kinds of traits and genes uh, that seem to segregate. There's a reproductive and a metabolic quantitative trait. Uh, again, GWAS was performed on genotype cohorts, limiting the cases to either the reproductive or metabolic subtypes. And what we found was that novel genetic variants were uniquely associated with each of the phenotypes. And I just want to show here that the carriers of previous reported variants of the DENDA 1A were significantly more likely to have reproductive subtypes. And finally, it's a call to arms or to research or to study that women with PCOS may be poorly served by being grouped under a single diagnostic criteria because PCOS subtypes differ in response to therapy and in long-term outcomes. Uh, something that we've been involved in for a while is AMH. AMH, as you can see here on the cartoon, increases GnRH neuronal activity and GnRH release. Gonadal and inside AMH increase gonadotrope sensing of GnRH signaling. AMH controls the small follicles and dominant follicle selection in the ovary. It also actually controls maturation of Sertoli and Lydic cell in total development uh, and influences androgens postnatally. Why is this important? 
AMH may be now thought to be a useful adjunct, AMH levels, in the diagnosis of PCOS in non-obese adolescents. My colleague, uh, former fellow, Aviva Sofer, looked at AMH levels in PCOS adolescents and controls. And although there was a slight overlap, there was a good distinction. Uh, but again, caveats not to be used yet as an alternative for the detection of PCOS morphology or as a single test for the diagnosis of PCOS. Recently elevated AMH levels in a European study uh, did not find AMH to predict PCOS. So again, more to come as what this is. But in both animals and human studies, there has been suggestion that there may be a five-fold higher risk for daughters born to mothers with PCOS for inheriting the syndrome. Well, why does this happen? And animal studies seem to suggest that daughters who are exposed to high androgens during their mom's pregnancy, uh, elevated AMH in late pregnancy produced PCOS offsprings uh, and offsprings with elevated LH pulsatility and elevated androgens level. This has not been done yet completely in human studies. We also want to tease you with the intracrine androgen biosynthesis pathway in adipocytes. Mature adipocytes can make their own testosterone. So for time, I won't go into the whole pathways, but in fact, we now know there is a separate uh, role of the fat cells in potentially PCOS. And again, this will be very important when we talk later on and learn more about the role of insulin resistance. Androgens can in fa fact, and we've known this for a while, impair beta cell function in the mouse model of PCOS by activating ER stress. And this is mouse studies uh, where the mouse was uh, made PCOS by injection of DHEA. Uh, they had a higher ER stress in their islet cells. Testosterone exposure induced even more ER stress in apoptosis. And blocking the process uh, with use of flutamide significantly relieved the ER stress in apoptosis. So again, androgens may be a significant culprit um, in ER. Uh, stress factors. Now let's go to the microbiome, which everyone is talking about. A recent study by uh, Melanie Kreese group looked at uh, uh, about 58 obese female adolescents, more with PCOS uh, and less without. Uh, participants had a decrease in alpha diversity compared with the non-PCOS group, looking at richness and evenness. We've done this work in Adrenoc population and also have shown differences in the microbiome. PCOS had higher percentage of relative abundance of a particular phyla. The significance of this is not fully known, but if you had Bacteroisades in your microbiome, you had a fourfold increased uh, likelihood ratio. If you had lower Bacteroisades, you had a fourfold likelihood increase of having PCOS. Let me go here. Uh, and of course, to refute what we've been looking at and others, there was a recent study out of uh, Finland that PCOS and non-PCOS women in late fertile age with similar BMI do not have significantly different um, microbiome profiles. So again, there's pros, there's cons. I know people are going to ask me since I am involved in Adrenarch, whether that's a predisposing factor for development of PCOS. A very recent paper in JCNM by Tanilia et al. among women using non-hormonal contraception who had PCOS, but who had a history of PA. There was a higher prevalence of hirsutism, but not of acne. And the only thing was that premature adrenarch in their study was not associated with evidence of ovarian dysfunction in the young adult. How 
whatever women with a history of PA or premature adrenarch had decreased SHBG levels and thus had probably increased bioavailable circulating androgens. I will say that with all the androgens, gin excess women, young children we see, and the ones with Adrenarch, I still say there is a relatively small, but some percentage of women who have uh, gone on to develop PCOS. And then uh, finally, it almost took the life of an elephant to be birthed. We, uh, after almost 10 years, Dr. Geller and numerous collaborators looked at the profiles of daughters uh, in, in uh, first, uh, let me go back, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just got pinged that I should conclude. Uh, here we go. in the profiles uh, observed in girls eight to 14 years with a mother or older sister with PCOS and glucose intolerance compared to those uh, mothers and daughter pairs 39 who had normal glucose tolerance. They were adjusted for adiposity and ethnicity. These results suggested actually of those with the more severe metabolic and hormonal imbalance had a possible higher metabolic risk in their daughters or sisters related to PCOS in women with more severe uh, metabolic dysfunction. And of course, it took many years to get these pairs, but I think more studies are needed to verify. And perhaps most conclusively, there are 10 databases that were searched, and this was just published a couple of weeks ago, uh, looking at uh, the reproductive health in first degree relatives of patients with PCOS. 38 studies, multiple criteria, of course, were looked at. Uh, it looked that female first degree relatives presented an increased level of LH, total testosterone, free androgen index, and so on. And actually what we've seen clinically, fathers of PCOS patients had a higher risk of premature baldings and DS levels were higher in the males of first degree relatives of PCOS. So let me conclude with what I want you to think about. You've heard a number of pros, cons, disputed new issues regarding the pathophysiology, genetic mechanism, and outcomes in PCOS. Most important, however, and I want you to remember that you cannot make this diagnosis for at least two to three years post menarche Ultrasound in our adolescent population is not recommended and going as far on consensus studies, some even feel that we need to wait eight years before we make a firm diagnosis. And I want us to consider the use of at risk for PCOS where we're still looking at data. So what should the management be? We should make the appropriate diagnosis or, or at risk reduce the symptoms that I talked about earlier, improve the post-treatment health in adulthood. And these approaches may enhance the preferential loss of central fat, uh, fat storage. Remember I said there'll be a whole new history on fat in certain ethnic backgrounds and girls with a history may be in fact of prenatal growth restraints. And the more low risk and low cost interventions for PCOS during adolescence, I suspect we'll have fewer high risk and or high cost treatments during adulthood and there'll be better outlook for the children of PCOS mothers. And I do want to thank my colleagues, Selma Witzel, Lourdes Ibanez, Helen Mateed, Kathy Hoger, and Alexa Pena, who in particular helped us with the adolescent uh, guideline publications a few years ago. So I thank you for your indulgence and I appreciate um, your listening.